So today, I'm going to do something totally different than yesterday. Uh, I'm going to be inspired, I am inspired by uh, Chava. Yesterday we spoke from, uh, from the whiteboard. And um, I'm also going to speak in the same style, which is slower and more concretely. Um, but I'm not very good at the whiteboard, and uh, I'm going to try to you know, make my own whiteboard here. See, this is my whiteboard. And the uh, good thing about the whiteboard is it's, it, slows, it slows the speaker down, and uh, you can go step by step and make sure that I, I don't say anything that doesn't make sense. Anyway, I think it's good. Anyway, we're going to try it today. And uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to try to do three things today. Now, if we don't do them all, it's OK. Uh, if we do just the, the first one, it would, be, it, would be, it would be instructive and good. The first one is to give you some sense of how temporal difference learning works and why it works. We've heard a lot about that yesterday. Uh, and then the second thing will be to show why it doesn't work. OK? Both of those will be. Uh, instructive. If that's all we get to, it's fine. Uh, but the third thing I'd like to do is present a new algorithm um, that solves, perhaps partially, the uh, a problem. Okay. And this new algorithm has not been presented. I've never presented it before in a talk. And uh, so you'll have to help me make sure I'm clear. Um, it's also never it hasn't been published yet, so it's sort of a world premiere uh, today. Okay, so let's get started. Now, remember I'm supposed to be writing. Imagine me here, trying to write. So I could go, you know, write, 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 temporal difference learning with linear function approximation. That turns out to be the core central uh, problem or setting, which we need to, uh, for a, a core model-free reinforcement learning algorithm. So we need approximations and we want to do uh, temporal difference learning because it's a, it's an efficient um, way of learning from interaction and learn value functions. And as you know from yesterday, learn general value functions. Okay, so we we'll, we we'll basic elements. We're going to need to talk about states. So I'm going to use capital letters for all of my random variables. This is my convention: capital letters, the random variables, and uh, these curly for the sets. This is the set of all states. This is the state at time t. And then similarly, we have actions. The action at time t is, is from set A. And you can think of these sets they were just the way Chaba did yesterday. I just think of this time as a bunch of integers. But there's so many of them. There are you know, more, even in, in a game like chess or backgammon, there are more states than there are atoms in the earth. And so we fact that they're a discrete set doesn't really help us. We have to use approximations. We'll never, one good way of saying that is we never visit the same state twice in our whole lives. Never the same state twice. There's always something different. We're a little bit older, different places. Every, all the other people in the world are all in different places. Never get the same state twice. The final element, the most essential element, is the rewards. Uh, we also get the time. There are just real numbers. Now, I, I like to call the reward a t plus one because you know here we are in this state, this action. Then as a result, we get the reward at the next time step. Some time has to elapse between what we do to the reward we get. Um, but many um, researchers, many scientists will call this RFT. I like to call it t plus one because the next state, the next state comes at the same time as this next reward, and they're they're jointly determined, and so they should have the same time index. Okay. And then, of course, we also talk about the policy, pi. Uh, I like to write it like this to show that it's a distribution. It's the probability that the action, the random variable capital letter A, takes on the value, the value lowercase a, uh, given that you're in that state at time t, at matching time t. Um, and so that's the policy. OK, and now um, a little bit faster. but. Um, we have to talk about the world. The world has transition probabilities. Now, the world has these transition probabilities. P probability of state J, given that you're in state I, and do action A. Okay? So that's this, right? I guess I should have been pointing at this. The probability that 
the next state, t plus 1, is j, given that the current state is i, and the, uh, the previous state is i, and the previous action is a. And those, that's what makes it Markov. Uh, those are transition probabilities. But this, this there's, I'm going to have this matrix. Right? Capital uh, bold things are going to be matrices. So that's the, the, the transition matrix. It's a kind of transition matrix, but it depends on the policy pi. Another notational convention is I have these brackets. Uh, when I talk, when I talk about the individual elements of a of a matrix or a vector, I'll put brackets. So this means this is a matrix, and its its ijth element is um, basically if you're in state i, how likely are you to take action a? And then given that you've taken action a and you're in state i, how likely are you to get to j? So the net result of the world, which is transition probabilities of the world, state transition probabilities, and uh, the policy, which is you, the agent, these two together determine probably going basically from I to J. Okay? Clear? Good. Um, the world is going to be ergodic, which means it has a stationary distribution. Um, so it means, yeah, you might start wherever you start, you, in the end, you end up in the same probability distribution. And uh, we can say that clearly. So d pi uh, is, is that distribution. So it's, uh, we're talking about these probabilities. Uh, this is the limit as time goes to infinity, because we're ergodic, that there's some probability of being in each state. There's some probability that the state of some time t way out in the future is s. Okay, there's, there exists such a probability by assumption, and so it doesn't matter where we start. In the long run, we're in the same places with the same probabilities, and we're going to call this, dist for distribution, the distribution under the policy pi, because where we are depends on the world, but also depends on us. Depends on what we do. Okay, so this is just probability distribution over states, given that we're following a policy, and there is one such number for each state, so we assemble these into a vector, and that vector is, has one, its, its s element um, is, is d pi, and so we're going to talk about it as a vector. So the vectors are going to be bold, um, but not capital. And notice, so these vectors, it has a lot of elements. It has one element for every state. Okay? How many states are there? Remember, there's an awful, great, horrible number of states. So although I can talk about this mathematically, I could never have an object like that, okay? I can never approximate it even. I mean, I, I could form something smaller that was in some way maybe an approximation to it, but I could never even hold an estimate, a direct estimate of this vector. And I certainly can't have a direct estimate of, of that, that matrix because the world is huge. Um, these transitions, these probabilities of being in each state, we assume are greater than zero. If there's some state that even in the limit, uh, well, in the limit, that you, you never visit them, well, then we could just forget about them. It doesn't matter. In an asymptotic analysis like I'm going to do today, we can just ignore them, so just take them out of the state set S. Have to be positive. And um, now this is the special thing about the stationary distribution. If you are in that stationary, just well, you know what it is. It's that if you're in if you're in some distribution and you go ahead according to the world and your policy, then you stay in that distribution, right? Because that's because it's the limiting distribution. Okay, so that little equation compactly says that if you if you take the distribution you're in and you go forward according to this transition matrix, uh, then you'll get your the same distribution out. Uh, of course. I actually, you know, this this little funny symbol. I don't even know uh, what the symbol is, but it's I'm using it to denote the linear op operation of this is uh, matrix uh, vector multiplication. Right? So it's so it's an inner product notation. It's like transpose. So it's the transpose of this matrix is multiplied times this vector. And so then it matches because by convention uh, all vectors are column vectors. Okay, so we're taking a column vector. And then we multiply it times this matrix, and it's set up so that then we get uh, we get the probability of the next state. If we 
we send in a vector that just has a one in it, it'll give us the probability of the next state. If we send in a distribution, it'll, we get out the distribution that results after one more step. Okay? So the special thing of the stationary distribution of an ergodic system is once you're in it, you stay in it. So this is true. Um, now, of course, we're interested not just in the rewards, but in the, the sum of the rewards. Okay? So here's our friend. Um, the return, the return is the sum of the rewards, each discounted by some number between zero and one. It actually can be zero, that's no problem. It has to be less than one. So we're going to sum them up. We get the first reward, a discounted version of the second reward, a twice doubly discounted third reward, and, and so forth, all the way out to infinity. And um, that's called the return. The return, of course, is a random variable, so it's capital. Okay, and we run out of letters, so we call it G now. I call it G. Capital G is the return at time t, and it's it's of course not available at time t because it's 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 the sum of all these earlier things, but it's a well-defined random variable, and and we're, we denote it as being at time t. Notice it also starts at t plus one. So at time t is is the return. That's the thing that you would like to maximize with your selection at time t. Um, and the value function. Um, which is what we're going to learn. It's all about learning value functions uh, as a key step towards learning a policy. The value function, I'm going to write it like this. V pi of a state is the expected value of the return given that you're in that state. Um, a couple of notational things again, just so you um, understand the way I'm thinking. V pi of a state is just a regular function. It takes in a state. Brings, gives back a regular number, a scalar number, right? It's, it gives back a return, which is a sum of rewards, which are real numbers. So it's all, re, it's all just a scalar number. And uh, so I'm, I'm trying to establish a new convention, uh, or it seems to me the right thing to do, even though we haven't done it in the past, the value function should be lowercase, um, because they're just numbers. You know, they, they, there's a, a, a scalar value function. I guess I learned last night from Chaba that the, this is, mathematicians call that a functional. So it's a functional. It's a, it produces a scalar, and so I denote it by a lowercase letter. Uh, the, and it depends on the policy. It crucially depends on the policy. We're going to try to learn the value function for the policy that we're following. Not some other policy. It's the policy that's actually going on and determining these future states and these rewards uh, and that, that has this special property uh, of expected value under the policy of the return, given that we start in that state, and this means that subsequent actions are selected according to the policy. Okay, so uh, now we get into approximations. To talk about approximations, we have to stop talking about discrete states and map them into something smaller. Okay, so this is, this is where that happens. We take any state, S, and we map it to a feature vector, X. So X is a real vector in R to the N. Uh, N is much smaller than the size of the state space. Okay, much smaller than the size of the state space. Uh, so it might be only like a million. Okay, we are trying to do massive computation. You remember from yesterday. So we want to do a lot of you know big complicated approximation. A million computers are big today. We could do we could have a billion component feature vector. And they do do this with you know big massive data problems. They have huge feature vectors. Um, so n is big, really big, but it's not anywhere near as big as the state space, and it's not anywhere near as big as the square of the state space. So just keep your bigs in line here in your head. N is something that we've chosen to work with. Okay, so we will be able to represent feature vectors, and we will we will perhaps I mean, we won't really have this function. X, which maps states to feature vectors, maybe the world will give us that function. Like we encounter a state in the real world and we process it through our, 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 our sensors, our eyes and our ears and our, our, our fingers, and we get all the feature vectors. And, um, and so, so, so realize the real state, though, is enormously complex and it generates your sensory data, but it's much larger than your sensory data. And, um, but it, yeah. Now, what it, what it often works out to be is that, like, uh, my world or my agent is maybe just a robot, you know, of some kind, maybe a robot arm, okay? And it has maybe six degrees of freedom or 12 degrees of freedom with the, uh, 
with the velocities. And then we take that 12 degrees of continuous numbers, which is, of course, a huge state space, all the different values of those, of those continuous numbers, and we, we uh, break that up into little pieces. And then we have one feature vector, one feature for each little piece, so that if I enter a region of state space, then I get a particular feature uh, be becoming high, becoming one rather than zero. And these, these little patches of, of uh, state space would overlap. Uh, just I think we saw some of that yesterday um, with the, um, the tile coding projecting up to a large binary feature space. So th this would be those large, large, uh, perhaps sparse um, feature spaces. Now pairing with the feature vector is a weight vector. Okay, so our weight vector, uh, these are going to be the parameters of our approximator. So this weight vector is the same shape and size as the feature vector. And we're going to take their inner product and that's going to be our estimate. And that's what I'm going to say next here is that the value function is going to be approximated as the inner product of the weight vector and the feature vector. So if I'm interested in this state, I look at its feature vector, maybe I'm in that state, so I get its feature vector. I take the inner product with the weight vector, which is only order n operations, and n is, is chosen so that it's really big, but manageable. Okay, so this is, you know, n multiplications and additions. We can do that. That's our approximation. Okay, that's the basic setup. Um, that's the basic setup, now I want to give you the algorithm. Any questions about the basic setup? Where the data is coming from, how to think about it. What do you think, Chaba? Does this look like a whiteboard? Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, okay, linear TD0. Linear, so it's linear because we're making an approximation, and it's going to be a linear approximation. We have, where our estimates are going to be this inner product. It's not, as opposed to it's like tabular TD0, would be, oh, I have, I have a, 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 diff, a, a table and I have an estimate of the value function for each distinct, discrete state. We, we also heard about that yesterday. We're doing the linear case, and TDE is temporal difference learning. Temporal difference learning, TDE, which just means di di time difference, which is just a change. And TD0 means it's the simplest case of this algorithm. Uh, there's a TD lambda, which would be a, a, a generalization, it's not hard either, but I thought I would just do the simplest case to get our intuitions well worked out. Okay, so here's the algorithm. It's all there, that's the whole thing. Okay, so it says we're gonna change the weight vector, the new weight vector. Oh, one other notation. You might have noticed these little dots over my equal signs. Now those are used whenever I'm making a definition. You know, like you write an equation down, it could mean two things. It could mean, oh, this is what, this is the name of this thing, this is a, a notation, a definition, or it could mean this thing that I've already told you about, this is a fact about it, okay? So I like to distinguish these two in the notation. So if there's a dot over it, it means it's a definition. So, right, this is the definition of a value function, this is the definition of a return. Um, this is a fact about some things that I had previously defined, right? These, both these were defined, this is a fact about them, so there's no, um, no dot over it. This is a definition. We're defining with the, for every uh, the weight vector at any time, how you get the new one. So the new weight vector is the old weight vector plus a step size. Alpha here, I should have said. And this is my chance to actually use the, the real whiteboard. Alpha uh, is, a, is just a scalar. And it's uh, the step size. We heard a little bit about that the other yesterday. So it's between zero and, um, and well, it's not, it's, not, it's not necessarily less than one. Uh, it's got to be strictly greater than zero. Uh, it could be quite large. Usually it's quite small. Anyway, it's a step size. And then, so the rest of the rule is sort of an error times the feature vector. And this, this whole thing is, a, is just a scalar. It's a number. It's an error, really. And then we're going to multiply it times the feature vector. So that gets us to the same dimensionality, right? This is what these one of these um, vectors, bold, w, w, bold means vector or, or matrices if it's capital. Uh, so we're adding in a new vector. This is the vector for the current state, the state at time t. OK, 
Okay, and then the error, the error is sort of the magic of temporal difference learning. Uh, the error is we're going to compare this thing. What is this thing? Right? This is, well, this is ex exactly the estimated value for what state? For the first state, the state at time t. We're doing a transition from t to t plus 1. So we have a t state and a t plus 1 state. This is the va estimated value at time t. This is the estimated value at time t plus 1 times gamma. So it's a little bit shrunk down, but we're also adding in the reward. And so this kind of fits into this form. It's sort of like the first reward, and these guys are themselves kind of a return with an extra power of gamma. So if everything is working well, if the values are exactly correct, this will in expectation be zero, and, and which is good, right? If, if, there, if everything is working properly as we expect, we don't want any learning. We're getting what we were expecting. But if we, if we, may, if we thought we'd get this much and then we're getting more, either a bigger reward or a bigger promise of future reward, then we want to increase our weight vector so that when we dot it in with states that are similar, that have some of the same features, when we take the inner product with those states, we would then in the future give a higher uh, value. And so this number in the future would be higher and that would tend to reduce the error. Okay, that's TD0 in, in one line. Question, good. And the first what is the, so we have the same weight vector for all the states? The same weight vector for all the states, right. So the, you distinguish between states through the feature vector. Different feature vectors for different states will pull out different components of the weight vector. Uh-huh. So won't it be much more generalized if we have something, uh, a different weight vector for all the states? No, no, no. That would be terrible. Like you come across a new state, and what will you do? You, first thing you'll have to figure out, well, well, which weight vector should I use? No, no, no. You want to take a standard thing over and over again, pull out your weight vector, apply it to the feature vector for that state, get your answer. Yeah. How do we get the value of weight vector at How do we how do we initialize the operation? That's a good question. Um, well, I guess you there you could do it however you'd like. All the, the results I'm going to talk about today are asymptotic, and, and so the results will be of the form that no matter where you start, you'll get to some bound of the answer. You'll get, you'll get to the same place. It doesn't matter where you begin, in fact. Yeah, so often you start at zero, but if you want to provide some domain knowledge, you might start with a, a better weight vector than, than zero. Yeah, there's a lot of things you could do. It's a good question. Shalom? Say again? The discount factor gamma. So the discount factor gamma, uh, in classically, as you know, in, in reinforcement learning, doesn't depend on, on, the, on the state. But of course, yesterday, that's exactly what I talked about. And um, everything that I'm going to talk that I, that I'm going to talk about, and, in, and in specifically the new algorithm, the emphatic algorithm, uh, handles the general case. The general case has general. Uh, gamma as a function of state, and general uh, lambda also as a function of state, and, and all, all the, other th the other things, which, which um, I guess aren't that too many other things. But, uh, so that works, but, but um, today we're going through the simplest case at TD0, and we're going to just, for convenience, we're going to assume that, that uh, gamma is constant. Just ordinary discounting. Ravi. Just one operation. Oh, that would be nice, but if you do have a question and you're not near a mic, or maybe I guess you're all near a mic. <laughs> Let's, you, any question? Okay, good. I, I, you were reaching for your microphone. I thought you sure you had a question. Uh, just a uh, quick question, but isn't W a function of random variables, so wouldn't you make it capital or? W, very good question, yes. Yeah, so W, I, I'm making this big deal about how random variables are capital, but W is not capital, X is not capital. Uh, X, X is a, X is, well, let's go first with W. W uh, really should be capital, but you know, you run out, okay? You run out of conventions because I want to use capitals for matrices. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I make the exception for, for things that are vectors and matrices. I, I make them bold and I give up on distinguishing uh, random from non-random events. Good question. 
Uh, similar, it is the same question really for, for x, because even though x is a function, it's a function, it's a, a random thing, so x is in effect random. And uh, I kind of feel it's the same way uh, like g is, is a, you know, it's, well, no, it's not even a function. Maybe I don't have any functions that are random, but if I did, I would make them capital. No. Yeah, so this guy is capital too. Is he? No. He's an expectation. Yeah, he's an expectation. He's not random at all. Good. Any other things like that? See, I'm writing the second edition of the reinforcement learning textbook, so I'm kind of trying to hit these things straight. And I really appreciate all your comments and what, what's clear and what's not, and what makes sense as I try to get these things right. So in the in the line where you define the value function, yes. uh, you write the approximation as a WT transpose. I think the T shouldn't be there, right? There's no dependence on time. Write the approximation as a WT <coughs> transpose. Uh, are you assuming there's an implicit constant W that is? Uh, w is what you're going to learn, right? Right. So w there's a subscript small T there, right? So. Doesn't all my, uh, this subscript T, that should be there, because it changes. So this is the, uh, oh, right, this, right, this equation, this is a definition of the value, but it's approximated at any time, right? At each moment you have a different approximation. Okay, so this, this is only approximately equal. That means approximately equal. So if our approximation is well, is, is working well at time T, then that will be approximately I guess the question is, um, there are two meanings of t. One is the number of time steps to go, and one is the iterations that we are doing as we are the uh, continually estimating uh, w. Okay. So I think t uh, subscript w, w subscript t, the t is the iteration and approximation. No? Is that not right? I'm a very simple man. There's only one t. Okay. And every moment, this is time, and every moment you, you update your approximation, right? You do this, this, this is the whole thing. There's no, nothing behind the scenes. You update the new t, the new weight, and every time step, you update it. You just do this equation. That's the whole thing you do. And you notice it, it works, uh, you know, computationally. Computationally, uh, right, we had to form these inner products. So this is like n uh, multiplications and adds. And this is n more multiplications and adds. And then this whole thing is just a number. And we multiply that scalar number times the feature vector. So that's... That's um, n more multiplications. And then we have one more add here. So we just, we just do it. order n operations on every time step. So we can do it on every time step. And you know, as I talked about yesterday, I think of each time step as being like a tenth or a hundredth of a second. And I think you know, we just do this, do this, do this, this is, this is life. Always doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same number of computational operations. Every moment as it passes, this feature vector comes in at time t, we process it, update the weights, throw that feature vector away, we never come back to it. We never try to store it. This is model-free, totally interactive uh, learning. Very simple. This is the whole thing. Any other questions? Really good questions. So I'm glad this whiteboard is making me slow down uh, a little bit. Being clear, I like that part. Okay. So we can rewrite things just a little bit. Uh, it's the same, same equation. I just grouped, so there's two terms of w. And I pulled them all out here. So now I take the inner product of w with the change, really, the change in the feature vector, right? Um, did I get this right? This is, oh, I've also brought in x. So the first term becomes r times x. Right? And then we have x on the outside is times all the all all these terms times then the change in x times the weights. Okay. So the, why do we do this? We do this because I want to get so partly because I want to get the weights by themselves. The weights, you know, just one term of the weights because that's what I'm going to update my iteration is in the weights. I still have some weights out here. Now this thing, we're going to talk about these two things, a and b. These are the key theoretical concepts or variables. This is a matrix, because this is a vector, uh, and this is a vector as well with an outer product. So this is an outer product. You know, vector, the 
this is a column vector. This is a transposed column vector. So this is a row vector. So this is column times row. That's a matrix. That's a really big thing. It's one of those inconceivably big things. And we're going to call it A of T because it, it depends on time right? as, as we go through. It's a different, different uh, matrix. And this one is a vector, B. Okay, so these are going to be things. And now, as we go f f into the future, uh, well, we can write this a little bit further. Um, so now we can write it in terms of those matrices, right? I think I, I didn't miss anything, did I? So this is just the B, alpha's on the outside, they make the B minus A times W. Okay, so I've just rewritten our update. And uh, I can rewrite that one more step using the identity matrix to get all my W's together. I'm going to get these two W's together, so I have I minus A with an alpha, I, I minus A alpha times the weights plus alpha times this vector B. All right, and, and uh, so that's what happens on every time step. Now, you know, I'm expressing it in terms of these matrices and these vectors. Wait, are these... Are these big vectors? Are these big matrices? No, no. These are small matrices. Right? Big matrices like the transition probabilities. This thing, I guess I didn't write it. So this is size, the number of states by the number of states. This is only number of features times number of features. Okay, so it's a small matrix, actually, and small vector. I mean, it's only like a million. Let's say it's a million uh, and, and A is a million by a million, but it's only a million. It's not like the number of states. Okay, so these are actually the small, the small matrix and the small vector. A is, but it's still too big. So almost by definition, we've chosen the number of features to be as big as our computer can handle. Um, and so square of it is just too big. We can never work with the, the matrix. Now this makes me, this is unusual. Usual uh, theoreticians will assume they can handle matrices and do operations on them, maybe even invert them, okay? But I could never, I'm never going to allow myself ever to do anything of size n squared. n squared is too big. Size n is as big as I can handle. Um, and A, the, the A matrix at time t, is of size n squared. And uh, so, so that's the trick of these algorithms, to try to find ways of getting the results of these matrix operations without ever dealing with the matrices. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be possible. Um, well, you know, we've just seen we, we can achieve this, which looks like a matrix operation, and we can achieve it because we started with something that's just as order n operations, this top thing. Okay? We're just, but we're writing it this way because we want to talk about the iteration, we want to talk about convergence, we want to talk about what it converges to. So, so convergence, uh, this is a stochastic operator. A is, is, is random, B is, is random, A of T and B of T are random. Um, and I want to talk, but the world, by assumption, is ergodic. It's, it's, it is converging you know, to a state distribution. Um, if we look uh, ahead out to the future, uh, you can often write down what we're going to call a deterministic uh, limiting update sort of an expected update. This is a little informal, and I'm just going to leave it a little bit informal today. Um, you can do it more carefully. Um, uh, so the expected update, it looks a, a lot like this, but we leave the t's. We leave the t's, uh, you know, in the long run, we're going to, A of t, we're going to be in certain states and certain state transitions, and so there's going to be um, a a, uh, a matrix A without a time index and, and a vector B without a time index. And these are going to be the limits. Uh, so A is the limit as time goes to infinity of the expectation of A of T. And I, I don't think I've written it down, but the same is true for B. B is the limit as time goes to infinity of the expectation of B of T. Okay? This matrix is a deterministic system. Um, so there, the, it's a different quantity. So these I'm calling W bar. It's like almost it's almost like the expectation of, of, of W at t plus one given the expectation at t. 
there's an iteration, this deterministic iteration update. Um, and if you understand this system, you it, it basically helps, enables you to understand the real stochastic system. Basically, in the limit, the uh, stochastic system will will converge or, or diverge just the same way that this deterministic system does. Yeah, this is a big step, and uh, you know, uh, you can almost take the expectations of the two sides. So you can talk about expectations because remember we have a, a limiting distribution d pi, and uh, so we can take if we take expectation of this, and the expectation of well this. Um, that gets that, and then this would be the expectation of the previous guy, and then so we're sort of just taking the expectations of the two sides. That's a good way to think about it. Okay, so from the last, well, that might be a little mysterious. Yeah, good question. Are you speaking into the microphone? <laughs> Okay, yes, the, the, according to the transition probabilities, Pij. And we're picking actions according to our policy pi. Yeah, pi is also stochastic, right? how we pick our actions. That's how the world is advancing according to, the, according to P, which is represented by the matrix P pi. Well, according to P, which is the world, and pi, which is us, the action picker. And then together they determine p pi. Pi is let's let's assume pi is fixed. So because pi is fixed, that means our, our way of behaving is fixed. That means we're not talking about control. You, you probably thought we were talking about control. We probably probably thought we were talking about learning what what to do. Okay, we're not talking about learning what to do. We're learning the value function for what we do do. Pi is fixed. Yeah, the, this is the most basic and thus essential central problem of, of learning, which is given a fixed policy, can you learn its value? It's a, it's a sub-step towards then, you would say, okay, now I've learned the value of the policy, can I make the policy better? But for, we're just going to do, and you have to be able to converge and have good solid results if the policy is fixed. Good. Any other questions? Yes? Regarding the learning rate alpha. Regarding alpha? Alpha. I think the upper bound is 1 for alpha. You think the upper bound is 1 from this? Well, because uh, 1 minus, so if alpha is bigger than 1, well, it depends what A is, really. Because, like, A is um, this outer product of the feature vectors. It depends how big the feature vectors are. Now, if the feature vectors were sized, were sized in a natural way, uh, such that A is sort of has size one, then you wouldn't want alpha to be bigger than one. But in principle, I haven't said anything here that says what what the size of the feature vectors, what the size of their components are. So if all their components were like you know 0.0001, then uh, then A might be very very small, and it would be okay for alpha to be. But yeah, we normally, you saw I wanted to write a one. You know, I think about it in those terms. But, uh, but technically, I don't think it has to be at this point. Mm, good. Anything else? OK, so, so we really, you know, you might think we haven't gotten that far. But really, this is, this is it. A is the, is the whole trick. And now we're going to talk about A. Because if A is, is stable, then the whole th then then this deterministic update is stable, and we're good. We won. We know it. We'll have convergence. This is what happens. So I'm talking about TD zero. TD zero converges in this setting, but for different settings it won't converge. So um, what does it mean? We can just look at this equation and, and see convergence, right? So this is. Uh, let's forget the fact that it's a matrix. What if A was just a regular number, a scalar, then all we need really is for A to be positive. If A is positive, then this deterministic iteration converges because, like, so go to the scalar case, this is 1 minus alpha times a 
positive number, uh, that's multiplied times the weight. You know, the, the new weight is the old weight, and we just uh, need it to be shrinking, to be, to be uh, getting s contracting. So if this number in parenthesis is less than one, uh, we're good, okay? And why I say that all we need is for A to be positive, because then I could choose alpha small enough. If this is, po you know, this could be 100, it could be 0.1, but if it's positive, then I can pick alpha so that alpha times A is less than one, and, that, and then one minus something less than one will be positive, and, and uh, will be positive, one minus less than one will be, so it will be shrinking. Yeah, I need the thing in parenthesis to be, to be uh, less than one. I mean, if it was two, if this thing in parenthesis was two, then I'd be taking the old weight vector and doubling it to get the new weight vector. But you add in this, this part will, will not matter for, for convergence. Uh, you could, for as far as convergence is concerned, that's why I'm not gonna talk uh, anymore about B because it doesn't affect convergence. It just matters if, I minus alpha A is less than one. It could actually be, um, uh, you know, negative as long as its absolute value is less than one. Um, but the problem is, if A is if A itself is negative, then we're subtracting a negative, and we're going to be adding something to one, and then we'll be expanding, and, and we'll diverge. Okay, so it should be. Clear, at least in the scalar case, that we need all we need, given that we can pick alpha, and we always get to pick alpha. Um, all we need is for it to be positive in the scalar case, and in the in the matrix case, it's not really that different. We have all these components, and we need all the eigen eigenvalues to be uh, <coughs> to be positive uh, of a. Um, so a determines convergence. If a is positive. So the right word is positive definite. Uh, so the whole system is, is stable if A is positive definite. And positive definite means that you can take any vector, we're gonna call this vector Y, we put it on both sides of A, and it's, and it's positive. So anything you send into A and then, and then dot with itself, inner product with itself, it's gotta be positive. So you can't like, send in something and get its opposite out. Because uh, then, then uh, it would be like a negative operation, and and then uh, this could be positive, and you could be bigger than one, and you'll diverge. So we need to be positive definite. If we are positive definite, then we converge, and we can even say what we converge to uh, is we converge to uh, a inverse b. A inverse b. And you can probably almost see that if we if we um, grouped. We said I want the, the limit. We group these two guys together, uh, and then uh, just another couple steps, you, you, can get, you can get this. Of course, you'd have to invert them in the matrix, but but that's what it is. And this this isn't in some way an iterative way of computing this value. Okay, so we need to be positive definite. Excuse me. Who's talking? Oh, sorry. Can't it be semi-definite? Like, uh, so if it was semi-definite, that just means it could be, it could be zero, right? That's what semi-definite means. That if you change this from a, has to be has to be greater than zero, it could be greater than or equal, and 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 uh, and I think that's exactly right. Actually, it's okay to be semi-definite. Then you will not explode, but you also won't contract necessarily. But it, you really, really, we will, um, we really only, it would be okay if there were things that didn't, that neither exploded nor contracted. Um, but it's sort of a little bit more difficult to handle the theory, so, so we will uh, formally make the assumption that it's positive definite, strictly definite. Good. Say again? When I make A deterministic, yeah. What are you taking the expectation over? What are we taking the expectation over? Um, uh, 
the expectation is over possible trajectories into the future. You know, this is a whole all a stochastic system. So a of t is a random variable, right? Because it depends. It depends on the state vectors, and the state vectors depend on the state. The state is random. So a of t is clearly a random variable, and you know, different evolutions. Uh, you know, probably I should write down the. the well, I, I goes. I almost said. S0 should be specified. The starting state should be specified. But my assumption the world is ergodic. And so it doesn't really matter where you start. So you notice I said the probability. There was this trick here. So how, how did we get away with this? I got away with this very early on when I talked about the probability that you're in uh, S at time t, that the state at time t is S. Um, and I, I said there is a limiting distribution. So you should be. You know, you should question this, actually. Uh, is, is, that, that, is that well defined? The probability that you're in a state at a time, that would only be well defined if I, if I specified how things started, okay? Um, so, but the limit exists. By assumption, there is an, the, the world is ergodic, then there is a limit. This limit exists, even if the, in, the specific probability for a particular time doesn't exist. Okay, so, um, so the events are random, but since it's ergodic, we go to a place and all these limits exist, and they don't depend on how you start. Yeah, over entire trajectories, yeah. Good. Good. Anything else? Good. I think you're understanding me. I'm so happy. Okay. So we're converges. If we're if everything is good, what's next? What's next? Well, we want to know is a positive definite. Like that's the whole ball game. So let's compute it. Let's compute a. It's this limiting expectation of a of t. So I just so this this thing here I've just copied it down. Right, this is a of t. Just expanded A of T from, from up above, expectation under pi. And then we continue to compute. We expand it. We expand it. OK, expectations. We sum over possible states. How likely am I to be in that state? I've dropped T. This step was where we dropped T, because we're going to lose the fact, we're going to use the fact that there is a limiting distribution. Okay, so in the limiting distribution, we are in each state, sum over all the states, how likely are we to be in that state? And you know, that's what an expectation is, right? How likely is each event? And then what's the value of the thing if that event happens, okay? So we're gonna look at, so now we just replace all the S of T's with S's now. Okay, so that becomes feature vector for S, the generic, value lowercase s for the individual possible thing. And then these two, although this one gets replaced similarly with the feature vector for state little s for s, gamma carries down. And now this is the next state, s of t plus one, but we're considering a generic uh, current state s. And so there's a generic next state, s prime. And what's the probability for each s prime well, this, you know, given that we're in S, we go ahead to S prime, we, we get each S prime with probability uh, P pi S S prime, the individual matrix, component of the matrix for that pair. Uh, and, then, and then we weight the feature vector for that next state. Okay, so that's just doing our, our applying our update. And so that's a, an easy step. And then we, we keep the transpose. Remember, this whole thing has a transpose on it. And, uh, and then, then you convert it to matrix form. It kind of it must, it, if you look, it, this kind of looks like all these matrix vector operations, right? Where, so you can matrix vectorize the whole thing. If you, if you, and these things always confuse me. So I, you should probably just trust me that these two are equal. Um, you have to sort of check everything lines up with the transposes 
and the linear operations, uh, but we're basically have have a term. Okay, so so what are these objects? These objects X. X is a matrix which consists of all the feature vectors. Okay, so each row is a feature vector for a state on uh, on its on its side to be a a row vector, so we have to transpose it. And d pi is basically d pi as a, as a matrix. So this is a diagonal matrix. d pi, now it's capitals because it's the matrix d pi. And these are all definitions. It's all right, this just means everything is zero except for the diagonal. On the diagonal, we have this big vector d. So notice these things are big, right? This, these are the size of the number of states by the number of states. This one is uh, number of states this way and uh, number of features the other way, okay? And uh, so with these objects, then we get exactly this equation and we can write it in matrix vector, well, matrix form uh, in this way. So we pull the, the x out here and so that's just the same thing written in matrix form. You guys could probably relate to that if you're, maybe you're better at this than I. I always have to like really write the sums and remember what a matrix matrix multiplication is. It's, it's really easy to make mistakes. Um, but this just translates those two equations. Any questions about that? I hope you don't have any questions that are too hard for me there. Okay, so, so now we have a matrix form, and we're almost done. Now, we need to know if this matrix is positive definite. Now, if you know, think about positive definite. Positive definite comes from, you know, multiplying something on each side. Okay, and it's kind of nice. So this, this form has x on each side, x and x transpose. So this kind of fits nicely into that, from that point of view. Uh, so really that thing, and this is A, this is A. A will be positive definite um, basically uh, whenever the thing inside is positive definite. Whenever this thing, this is, and we're gonna call this the key matrix. This is the key matrix. And um, if this key matrix is positive definite, then A is positive definite because you know, so if I could take any vector y and multiply it on either side of this thing, well then I just move that y outside here, uh, say on this side, and then it's y times x, and that's just another vector, and y prime or something, and then that will be on each side. And so if, if the inside thing is positive definite, then the outside thing, the whole thing is positive definite, and I'm stable, and I'm one. Good. So I think you also require that the columns of x are linearly independent. I, I require that, or I have to go back to the issue that uh, the other gentleman brought up about it's okay to, um, uh, if, if it's semi-definite, okay? It actually will not change, you can't get divergence if, if, if X is, and then we will, you know, the first answer is yes, we will assume for technical purposes that, that X has full rank, um, and yeah, we will do that. But again, it's, it's probably not necessary for stability. It's necessary for convergence, um, but not for lack of divergence. Good, any other comments, clarifications? Okay, so this is our job. We have to now work on the key matrix. And when I, one more comment, I think. Oh yes, so so this, this is a, a particular, I, I showed uh, in, in the first paper on temporal difference learning, that this key matrix is positive definite. Uh, any matrix of this form, I'll talk about what that means, is positive definite if it's the sum of its rows are positive. Um, so why does that make any sense at all? Now here I think I, I have to, I wanna just wave some. So we're interested in whether a matrix is positive definite so, so here's a matrix, and what turns out to be the key thing is the diagonal of it. Uh, if the diagonal is big, then you're gonna be positive definite. <laughs> if the diagonal's big, 
then you're basically you know sending in the vector and you're getting the, the same vector out bigger if it's big enough then you're going to be positive definite and um, so there's a theorem that says if you're if a matrix is diagonally dominant um, then you're then you're positive definite so diagonally dominant um, means that the diagonal is bigger than the off-diagonal terms. Um, and uh, so you either add the matrix to its transpose or you look at both. You have to look at it both ways. So you have to look at this way and, uh, and that way. And if the diagonal element is bigger than the sum of all those guys, then you're uh, diagonally dominant. And then you also have to look at the other way. Compare the diagonal element to the sum of all the other ones. If, you're, if the diagonal is bigger than the sum of all the other guys in the row and column, then you're diagonally dominant. The diagonal dominates the operation of the matrix. Now, we're kind of good in that way, because look at our matrix. Our matrix has an I minus gamma times a probability matrix. Well, the probability matrices, you, you know things about them. Gamma, gamma is less than one, so it's not going to make things big. big. Um, so the tr probability matrices, if you look at their row sums, their row sums uh, sum to one. I don't know, rows or columns. I, well, I guess it's the, uh, the row sums sum to one. Uh, and let's say, if you don't correct me. The, and so the row sum, and then we're, we're subtracting them, and we're adding one. So the one on the diagonal from the I is what makes it diagonally dominate. And, we, and so it, it's going to be true for the, for the rows. The rows of, of this matrix are clearly going to be uh, diagonally, uh, the, the diagonal will be bigger than the sum of all the others. And in fact, the, the sum will be positive. Now, we multiply times D. Well, D is, is a diagonal matrix. And it, we can't really uh, change uh, this property. And so, so our, our rows are going to be good, but the columns could be bad. You know, you can have many, even though for every state that comes into a probability matrix, you, you know, you, the, the places you can go to have to sum up to one in probability. But then if you look at the places you might go to, you, there may be many high probability of getting to a particular state. And so the columns uh, you have to worry about. And you only have, so the key thing are, are the columns Greater than uh, greater than zero, because that would mean that diagonal is dominating. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. Uh, and yeah, but I, there's further mysteries like how it is. Well, I guess it's yeah, if, we're, if we're positive definite, then we're going to be good. So how are we going to? Uh, are we po are the column sums greater than zero. So there's a couple little, you know, I'm, I'm, it's okay that it's not immediately transparent. Uh, but you can put together two little theorems and you get that as long as your column sums are greater than zero, then this matrix is positive definite. So it always comes down to showing that the column sums are greater than zero. So, so let's do that. And I've got all this stuff written up here and I don't really I uh, wanted to give a new slide that shows that the column sums are greater than zero. So I'm just going to use the big advantage of the computer over the whiteboard is that I can just kind of push things around instead of erasing them. So let's push everything around and make a little more space. Okay? Now I have a little more space, but I've kept the most important things. We're still, remember, we're just worrying about this matrix A and now we're just going to look at its column sums. Okay, so here are its column sums. So this is the matrix. So I could put, I could, well, I, you know, with the key matrix, I only have to worry about the things inside. So this is the thing inside. I put brackets around it. Now I can talk about its ij element of the, the whole thing. And uh, ij row column j is the row, yeah, well, it's for column j, I have to sum over i. Okay, so I'm going to sum the, this is just the sum of all the components i in the j row. 
the jays come. You with me? No, just, just writing it down according to our notational conventions. And then, um, so what is that? Well, uh, what's some, this is a, this is a matrix times a matrix. Okay, so every matrix is a sum. Every matrix, matrix times matrix, matrix multiplication is a sum. And so we sum over, over k. Um, this thing is i kth element to the kj element of the second matrix. Okay, that's just the definition of a matrix multiplication. And now we use the special property. Uh, uh, this d is diagonal. So it's zero except if, if the indices are the same, except if, if k equals i. So we can drop this sum because k, if k is not i, then it's zero. Okay, so we drop that sum, we just write it in k is i, so we have dii, and then this k also becomes an, an i. Okay, so that's clearly true. And then next step, well, this thing is just d, little d. The ith component, it's just, you know, the probability of being in that state at time uh, in the length state i. And then that writes out just by distribution. Uh, this, oh, this is, we're now realizing this is a vector matrix inner product with a vector summing over i, so that can be written as a in vector matrix form. We have to transpose this guy. And then that distributes d with the i and d with the other part distributes. And why have we done all this? We've really done all this because this thing looks like that thing. Okay, we trans if we transpose the two sides, um, the D moves over to this side and becomes transposed, and the P loses its transpose. So it's this. So this whole thing here is nothing but uh, D pi transpose. And now we're subtracting two things with D pi transpose. And so we get one minus gamma times d pi transpose in the jth component. We get just that. And that, well, one minus gamma, one minus gamma, gamma is less than one, so this is positive, and this is positive because it's how like they are in the state, which is probability, and it's by assumption greater than zero. So the whole thing is greater than zero. Our column sums are positive, and we're celebrating. Converges. Okay, so now you can prove the convergence of TD0. Did that for the first time in 1988? Yeah, that took me a long time. Uh, okay, so, and that was our first hour. But we've done something. Um, and it turns out that the same trick is relevant to the modern algorithms. Okay, any questions? Right, so I was just wondering if the proof goes through for episodic MDPs if you said gamma to be one. Oh, there's another one. Yes. Proof. It does. I mean, there are some small changes, but the same argument goes through. And is there a TD zero like algorithm for average reward? Is there a TD zero like algorithm for average reward? Uh, yes, yes. Basically, I think everything is the same. There may be people here that have considered. Yeah. So the statistical and Van Roy result, um, and the, it also in the neurodynamic programming book, the works. Um, is about the limit and the quality of the result that you get to. Um, yeah, so it all goes through for all the cases, I believe. That's the right way to think about it. Any other questions? Okay, so now I want to talk about off-policy learning. And this, we just did the case where it works, on-policy. On-policy, what does that mean? Well, what is off-policy? Off-policy means you're learning about a policy that's different than the one that generates the data. So notice what we just went through, there was pi. There's just one policy, pi, 
We wanted to know its value function, and we were picking our actions according to that same policy pi. What if they're different? What if you want to know the value of policy pi, but you're actually picking your actions according to a different policy? We're going to call the other policy mu, okay, just for a different name. So if we have two policies, then it's, it's going to be all policy learning. So why does this happen? Well, you shouldn't have to ask why does this happen, because you heard me talk yesterday. I talked all about, you know, I'm going to want to learn the value, if, the value of um, thousands of different policies. So they can't all be the same as the one that you're doing. You're only, you can only do one thing. You can learn the values of many, many things. So it's, it's something we definitely want to do. Okay, that's the way I feel. But, you know, for most people, I, we, have, we give the explanation is that uh, we want to do Q-learning. So Q-learning is off policy, because Q-learning, you, so in Q-learning, one of the nicest things about it is you can behave randomly. You can actually just behave totally randomly, and yet you, the algorithm will figure out the optimal policy. You know, how cool is that? Is, you know, behave randomly, figure out the optimal thing. And if you can do that, then, then you could figure out, you know, uh, uh, a, a thousand different optimal things in your head. Um, just by having a different part of your brain watching all that random behavior. So unfortunately, uh, Q-learning doesn't work with function approximation. It's off policy, basically off policy has problems with function approximation. What do I mean by function approximation? I just mean that we have the linear uh, process. We have weights and feature vectors and we make an approximation. That's what we've been talking about, function approximation. So once you go to off policy, your, your assurances of convergence don't hold up anymore. Uh, so Q learning, hear me, Q learning with function approximation is not really a sound algorithm. It may often work, but it's it, there are counterexamples. I can show you a perfectly ordinary set of feature vectors and states and transitions, and you apply Q learning to it, and the weights go to infinity. Uh, so if we want to do Q learning with function approximation, we have to figure out this off policy problem. And if we want to do all the things I talked about yesterday, this ambitious view of knowledge and prediction, we need to do off-policy learning and have it be, as Sridhar was describing, we really want it to be uh, reliable. You know, we don't care. I mean, the off-policy case is harder, so maybe we can't converge as fast. Maybe we can't get as good of, a, of an approximation, but we don't want it to blow up. We want things to be reliable. Okay, so... And one way of thinking it is that there are three things that we want to do. And actually, we would, there are convergent algorithms if we were willing to give up any of the three things. Okay, but we really need each one of these three things. The three things we, we need are function approximation, temporal difference learning, and um, off policy. So if we were willing to give up, say, temporal difference learning and just do Monte Carlo learning, then we could do off policy. Well. Could you do off policy? Yes, you could. It's extremely uh, noisy, and it's extremely high variance, and basically it doesn't work well at all. Um, well, it depends upon how different the policies are. But if you want to do temporal difference learning, and I tell you we do, if I had more time, I'd show you, you know, the examples. If you, if you, uh, the, the parameter lambda basically lets you move between temporal difference learning and Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, which Monte Carlo I, I just means you know, instead of using your next guess, just wait and see what actually does happen. Now, it's hard to do that in the off-policy case because, you know, you're not following the right policy. And so what you see what happens, but it's not what happens under the policy you're trying to learn. And so you need to bring in important sampling and, and, and readjust for that. Uh, and that's why it becomes high variance. Um, so, but if you vary the lambda parameter, it lets you smoothly slide from pure TD0, which we've just talking about, all the way to Monte Carlo, where you wait and see the final outcome. Now, given that, you can then try the same algorithm, TD lambda, with variable varying the value of lambda from TD to Monte Carlo. And the algorithm will perform well, typically, uh, but as you approach lambda equals 1, as you approach Monte Carlo, the variance uh, goes way up, and you get poor performance. It's, you know, the graphs look like this get to one, as you get to Monte Carlo, you don't want to do Monte Carlo, it turns out. Um, but if we were able to give up any of those things, it would be okay. 
doesn't matter if we get to everything I was going to talk about. This is supposed to give you some intuition of why uh, off policy fails. Why it fails. Okay? So, this is what the algorithm we've just been talking about TD0. And then just consider this simple world. So, this world is two states, and, and we go from this state to that state deterministically with the reward of zero, and then we go from this state to termination. This is the end of the episode with the reward of zero. And um, now the feature vectors for the two states are one and two. So the feature vectors are just scalars. And so the weight vector is just a scalar. The weight vector is W, then it's a number. And, and so that's why I write W and 2W, because this W is the approximate value of the state, because its features, its feature vector is one. So it's feature vector times weight vector is just w, right? One times w, and the other feature, the other state has feature two, and so its approximate value is two w, right? It's just a degenerate case of the inner product. So this, so suppose w, the single weight vector number, is suppose it's 10, then the, that means that the estimated value of this state is 10, the estimated value of that state is 20, okay? So you go from state, so what's the real value of state of this first state? What's the real value of it? Does anybody know? Zero, zero right? Because it's the rewards, so you're gonna get it all zero. Uh, and, um, but the estimated value is 10, 20, and then of course things end, okay? Um, but if you're looking at this first transition and you apply this algorithm, right, the algorithm uh, here you say, oh, I'm thinking I'm going to get 10. I think I'm going to get 10. I don't get anything yet. I get the zero. But I get to a place where I think I'm going to get 20. So it feels good. You know? It looked like things are getting better. And because of that, I'll actually increase the value of this. Uh, I'll increase W when I, when I, during this transition. You can see that. Let's look at it. So the error, what's the error? Right, this thing is 10. This thing is 20. So this is an episodic problem, so we can take gamma to be one. Okay, so we can ignore gamma. So we go from 10 to 20, to zero along the way, but who cares, we got to 20, and so this is an increase. The thing in parentheses is a plus 10. Plus 10 times the weight vector, well the weight vector for the first state is one. And so we're, and so let's say alpha is one tenth. So we'll actually add one to W. w So, suppose that happens again, just the first transition. If we get just the first transition, we go from here to here, from 10 to 20, it feels good, we push W to 11, then the second time we'll go from 11 to 22, that feels even better. Okay, I just went up by 11. So each time you, 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 you go on this first transition, you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The way it goes without stopping. Now, that leads to divergence. Now, we need the second step. TD will not diverge because whenever you go from here to here, you then go from here to there. Okay, and the second transition um, goes from 20 to zero. Yep, the, the termination is, is by definition is value zero. And so you are then are tremendously disappointed to go from to zero, and um, so for, for termination, this state will be zero, and so you'll go from 20 to zero, you'll be very disappointed, and that always overwhelms it, as we've just sh sort of shown, proved. The, uh, in the, if you do both links, both steps, then you are guaranteed to be stable, but if you only do the first link, then you can be divergent, and this is basically what happens uh, with off-policy case. Um, yeah, all the steps of any trajectory together always lead to convergence, no matter how you start things. Like if you could start here and go forward, you could start here and go forward, uh, no matter what the feature vectors are. Um, and also, yeah, the continuing and discount case, continuing discount case. Uh, but off policy causes some transitions to be omitted. It's 
that happens because let's say uh, you know that maybe from here to here you're following your target policy, but here you do something else that sort of doesn't count because you wouldn't do it, or target policy would never do it, so you kind of throw it away, and that's what happens in an off policy case. Some sometimes you're not following the policy and you can't count those transitions, so you get just the first ones, and so you can. Okay, um, so, so I want to just give you a feeling now for how the rest of it goes. Um, and uh, so there's another slide that's like the one we did very slowly for the off policy case. And we just have two policies, pi and mu. We're still gonna be, uh, we're gonna follow pi. We're gonna follow mu, excuse me. The behavior policy, behavior and target policy. Behavior policy is one that generates behavior. So now our distribution will be a function of mu. And but we're still interested in v pi, and we'll still approximate it in the same way. All that will be the same. That's the new situation. We have to assume that they're consistent in a certain manner. We're going to form uh, important sampling ratios. The probability of doing uh, what we did under the two policies, and basically, uh, yeah, if we are, if we did something that we, if we did something under mu that we would would never do under pi, this would be zero. Then the ratio would be zero. And it can also go the other way. Um, we might have done something that we would do more often if, if under the target policy, and then the ratio would be greater than one. But in expectation, it's, it's one. And this, this, this generally enables us to control random variables and convert it from one distribution to the other in expectation. And so this would be an off-policy algorithm. It's the same as TD0, except we introduce the important sampling uh, row, just multiplies each update by row. And if you do the same kind of analysis, you'll get a new A matrix, and you can compute out uh, its, its uh, expectation and write it as a matrix, and then we have a key matrix again. But notice now, before we had p pi and d pi, now these the distributions don't match, and because of that, uh, we can be unstable. And and so this even a simple example like this, you can show you can compute the, the matrix. This is the key matrix, and it's it's, it's Column sums, as you can see here, don't uh, sum to a negative quantity, and then we have the lack of positive definiteness, and we get uh, so. Maybe I have time just to sort of outline the final solution. Final solution is not the final solution. Um, it's not even the current solution. The current solution maybe is a gradient TD, uh, or the current solution is probably. The, uh, the advanced gradient TD methods that Sridhar will be talking about. Are you do that today? Yeah. yeah. So he'll be. So really, everything. You know, we we've now seen the off policy problem in more detail. Okay. And uh, we can talk about solution methods. It's been more, it's been an outstanding problem for 15 or 20 years. Um, the gradient TD approach is, is a good approach, and uh, Sridhar is in uh, perfecting and improving that. Uh, what, uh, yeah, there's a new approach that I'd hope to get to today. It's called emphasis. I'll be able to say just a little bit about it. Um, so, so the basic idea is that the distributions don't match. So, uh, you know, you want to learn the value of one policy while following a different policy. But this different policy might take you to totally different states. Um, it's, in some sense, it almost seems hopeless that you could learn about a different policy than the one you're following. You know, like, as I say, you can't learn about sailing a boat by, you know, cooking at home. Okay, you're just in a totally different set of states. Um, but, you know, this, we're, we're not trying to do the impossible. We're just trying to say, well, yeah, but I can learn about sailing a boat by 
uh, sailing a catamaran or even rowing a boat, I can, I can learn about it, some things. So, but the moment problem is the distributions are different and uh, we have to control for that. So emphasis tries to control for it. Uh, so what is this emphasis thing? Well, if we went through the steps there, we add one additional variable, a scalar variable called the follow-on trace. And the follow-on trace is supposed to keep track of how much the current, the current state that I'm encountering is like the states that I would encounter under the target policy. Okay, so this is just going to do this. Really, maybe I only want to do this line, which is say, this, is, this then is the new algorithm, these two lines. And it's exactly like the old algorithm, except, well, the one that we talked about today had, has neither of these terms, right? We need the row term, that's the important sampling term, in order to adjust for the change in policies that you're getting. But we've added the F term, which is, we're saying, so rho, these two both vary from time to time. That's why they both have time indices on them. Rho says, how, how close is the action I took to what I would, the target, target actions? And F says, how close is the state to what the kind of states that I would be encountering if I had been following the target policy? And so it's, it's, it's entirely a, a scalar adjustment and, and, and varying the, up, the update at time t be scaled up or down according to F. Uh, so F here is how emphatically I'm going to make the update on this time step. I'm going to emphasize this time step according to F. And that's the whole algorithm. And then you go through the same steps. You get your A matrix. And the key matrix, you have a diagonal now for F that's related to that distribution. And you have a, a recursive relationship for F. It's not the same as the as multiplied times pi, but it's, a, it's an analogous thing that F uh, is related to uh, the distribution and the, the transition probability. So this, this becomes the key thing that replaces the D pi times, times the, the recursive relationship where you stay in the same distribution. So we're going to use that then to look at the, uh, the, the, the jth column again and the jth column according to a very similar set of operations, except uh, here we plug in this, this relationship, and, and then that makes everything come back to zero again. Okay, so, so it looks kind of like that, the same kind of analysis. And, uh, and then if you go back to the example, you can show that then the, just compute, um, the key matrix now is gonna be positive, its row columns will be positive because you've emphasized this, the, the, the state that you need to emphasize. And, um, and this just going to carry through that example, and I should be kind of done. Row sums are positive. Some empirical things where we show uh, the new algorithm converging, whereas the off-policy algorithm would, uh, would diverge. And it's not 100%, that we can still get very high variance. If you look at an individual trajectory, it might be very large. There's still a variance issue, uh, but we get much better stability. And uh, so, so if I have a final minute, this is my last slide, just to say what some of the re results are for the emphatic algorithm. What's the, the one that I would have showed you, emphatic TD0, it's the simplest TD algorithm, linear function approximation that's stable under off-policy training. Just showed some empirical illustrations. But the main result is the stability theorem. It's actually not a convergence theorem. It's the theorem in, in the paper by myself, uh, Mahmoud, and White uh, uh, proves that the A matrix is positive definite. It doesn't do the full convergence theorem, just because um, that's an important additional step. Um, but since then, uh, Janie, who's now at U of A in, in Alberta, um, has shown the full probably one convergence theorem. And also, I've just learned that Remy um, has, has obtained the approximation bounds that are analogous to the Sitzis and Van Roy bounds uh, on, on solution quality. And just 
the final mind-blowing thing is you should realize that emphatic algorithm is also a new algorithm, even for the on-policy case. And uh, I believe it's actually going to be a better algorithm, but that remains to be worked out. So thank you very much for your attention. So how does uh, this compare with the GKD algorithms? That's a good question. That's a good question. And uh, okay, so the theoretical and algorithmic facts are easy to state, but the, I think the real concern is the uh, empirical performance. And empirical performance, I've I've hesitated to to make a, a statement on that, or even to do the empirical work because I think it needs to be done carefully. It needs to be done well. So, but the, the, uh, the facts of the algorithm and the theory, um, well, so sort of just the facts of the algorithm, because that's where it improves. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we improve over GTD because, although, you know, GTD is also kind of one of my babies. I want it to do well. But, but uh, we improve over GTD because we only have one set of parameters. GTD will have two weight vectors. One for, it has an auxiliary weight vector, and they both have to be updated. So. That's not a big deal. It's just twice as much memory. Uh, a bigger deal is you have to set the step sizes for the two parameters, and they have to be set uh, slightly delicately with respect to each other. And so uh, it is it, it inhibits people from doing GTD that you have to set these two uh, parameters uh, appropriately. Uh, although I'm, I'm thinking that Sridhar's work maybe eases those concerns. Um, so you know the, the the jury is still out. Is is, is as an answer. It's good to have multiple directions of solution. Uh, it's even possible to combine the two ideas so that, so that uh, you can get the sort of simplicity and uh, maybe reliability and maybe even the, the sometimes improved uh, speed of, of plain TD and yet still have some of the gradient properties of uh, gradient TD. So we've, we have not, this, the emphatic algorithm doesn't follow the gradient strategy. It doesn't try to find, find, define an objective function and then follow its gradient, uh, just like TD does not. I don't think there's anything noble about having a gradient descent algorithm. It's, it's one strategy for convergence. It's not the only one. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Yeah, right. Just to understand the uh, divergence counterexample, on your slide, also Baird's counterexample, which I don't remember very well. Divergence was not merely a consequence of the fact that the policy with which we were updating did not visit all the states uh, infinitely often. It, actually, as long as the policies, uh, the distributions are different, divergence could happen. Yeah, you have right? to visit all the states equally often in order to have a chance of working. So all the counterexamples, you, know, you, you are visiting everything infinitely often, but it's because the distributions are, are, do not match exactly that you would get divergence. Right, and uh, what you, I guess, mentioned is Remy's approximation results. It gives you a fixed point for the uh, two policies, two, two distributions being different. I imagine uh, there is a bound on the distance between uh, the, these two fixed points, right? Is that the kind of result that he's obtained? Um, it's, it's um, so the, the, the asymptotic fixed point results are all bounds, so the error of, you know, there's the best possible error you can achieve with the linear function approximation, and then there's the error you achieve with the fixed point found by the algorithms. The algorithms are not the best possible, but they're a bounded distance away from the best possible. And uh, the, the bounded distance, it, it has to expand a little bit in the off-policy case. Um, but it, the bound is on the error, not on the distance between the, the fixed points. Okay, thank you very much.